I trust that you. I will do that. Thanks. And so this is the NeoBooks call for Monday, April 29th, 2024. Uh, Stacy had a question about infrastructure, but also about a particular video uh, that's building from our conversations about trauma that we did on the OGM regular calls. And uh, Stacy, the video that in question, is it on YouTube? It's on YouTube. It's um, on the Mia Culpa podcast with okay. Michael so Cohen. So uh, the simplest possible thing is to go to the place where the clip you want starts and then say, share this, and then click the little checkbox that says, start at this time. Oh. And you can basically give anybody a URL to a YouTube video and it'll say ampersand T equals some number. And the T is the number of seconds inset from the beginning of the, of the whole video. But if I do that on Facebook. Yes. Will it still start at that clip? Um, on Facebook, it should. If you give the clip to the offset, it should start playing it. It'll it'll show the whole video, but it should start playing exactly where you sent the offset to. Yeah, and that's the other issue. You can't change the thumbnail, so the thumbnails are always inflammatory because these people that post on YouTube they want to get right. the hits, and that's not going to help for what I need. So another thing you could do. Uh, is you could download the video from YouTube, which is doable, but starts to get a little bit technical. You could then cut out the snippet that you really want, basically cut out the front and back, you know, that, that that's irrelevant to what you're trying to do, uh, and then upload, re-upload that, in which case you're sort of re-uploading their material, which isn't all that cool either. And you could put your own thumbnail on it with a sort of a, a warning or whatever else. There's that's like three or four mildly technical things in there that you probably want to avoid. <laughs> um, so what you might do instead is do the, the the start clip, you know, start clip at this offset. Do do that thing. That's really, really simple. Just when you hit the share button, you'll see a little checkbox that says start at this time. Copy it'll and it'll say copy link. So that then you'll have the link in your clipboard. Paste that into Facebook and then write a very elaborate trigger warning or something to people that says, hey, you you might get, you know, sent somewhere to the, sent to the moon by this thing, but uh, really it's worth watching and here's why or something like that. Okay, thank you. That should, that should work. That ought to work. Thanks, thanks for asking. Um, how's everybody else? Thumbs up from Jose. Klaus is in, Klaus is in the uh, Enterprises bridge, ready to go for the week. Uh, Rick, we don't know, but he's here and he's, it, we're happy he's been in the conversation so much. Um, anybody with any check-ins for uh, where we are? And and I've got a check-in first, which is I have two pretty big priority projects that I'm not done with yet that are that are keeping me from doing the what is a neo book presentation, which I really want to do. That'll happen next after these are done and then closing in on the the end of the the two things that are important, but I'm I'm not quite done with them yet. So I don't I don't have any news on neobooks from me uh, to check in with today. Anybody else? We've managed every week to talk about some interesting corner of of the project, and you know Rick will be like, yeah, but what about this thing over here? And we'll we'll head off and and sort of I think address or solve some of these interesting questions. Uh, but what's on people's minds today? And we can also run shorter if you don't want to uh, hang out in this in this mode. Go ahead, Jose. I've uh, been thinking quite a bit about last time we spoke, um, the idea that um, that we need something different than the traditional technologies that we've been using in order to do this. Um, and so I've been playing a bit with IPFS web three storage um and and a new database structure um that's local first called um fireproof uh, can you put a link in the chat yeah fire did you say fireproof yeah i'll, I'll uh, give it to you thanks um And, and so I've been thinking about the idea that 
if we're going to actually be making this data um, open source, that we need an open source decentralized data layer. Um, and that that data layer would then, on top of it, have a protocol around what the structure of this data would be. And then some interface that would allow us to access this data that would be open source code that people would be able to um, find, sort, edit, comment, whatever, this type of data. Um, and, and it would all be open source so anybody could write it, whatever front end they want. Um, and then a, an index of this data that people could peruse. So um, the the index would be, I think, what what Klaus has mentioned a number of times, some kind of um, front end sort of platformy thing that would give us um, a sense of okay, here's all of this data that's in there, here's the structure, and so that that's been my exploration over the last couple of weeks um thinking about this from a a more um uh, open source web3 type of thing so i don't know if that makes any sense to anybody it, it is rather technical um but um that maybe at the very least we could think about conceptually whether that makes sense and if that's the direction that uh, that we might want to go um, it does make sense to me. Uh, it is a little bit technical. Were you on the call or calls where we've discussed Rich Burden's Composer software and DXOS? Uh, yes, you you shared that last week with uh, Rick and I. Because that's um, he's built a, a very powerful platform that is distributed uh, and open source and a bunch of other things. So. Um, and happy to experiment with that. I know I, I've never heard of Fireproof. I'm just adding it to my brain now. And starting to choose distributed stores is sort of beyond my pay grade. I trust Pete, you know, to to sort of say this thumbs up, thumbs not, thumbs down on different kinds of things. Uh, and Pete and I were both starting to experiment with um, this composer thing, but nobody else was sort of uh, really going, hey, that sounds cool. Let me jump in too. So we've, we've stalled a little bit there, but Pete knows Rich from a previous life. They used to work together. I think uh, I think Rich hired Pete for a while, some years ago. So Pete knows about Rich's technical chops and all that. And there's um, a lot of goodness in that platform. Um, and there's also lots of other things that run on IPFS. I'm just looking quickly at the at the Fireproof site and it looks like it, IPFS is one of the choices you might make as a, as a backend, a distributed backend, which is cool. It's like, they're trying to create an intermediate layer to map uh, objects. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a local first database. So basically it gives you a little database inside your uh, code. And um, and then you, you just use IPFS or S3 or any of the other storage places as a, um, as a distribution slash uh, redundancy layer. Yep. And, and then you can also give your peers access to it. So the software can actually say, okay, let's find the other peers and let's start sharing this with, with peers. It's There's uh, also, sorry. Yeah. Ryan. Go ahead. Did you run into a service called Riffle? No, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I, again, I don't know much about this, but I've just, <clears throat> I'm just looking into uh, local first databases. There's Riffle. And then <clears throat> um, one of the startups that I, that I had a lot to do with um, when I worked with BetaWorks last year, lot of more than a year, more sort of more than a year ago, created a system called Fission, and I don't know if that's still running. Yeah, that's Fission another, is still that, running. That's, that's another candidate as well. And Fission, we would actually have some connection to the people Boris Mann and Brooklyn Zelenka. Yeah, they're, they're up there with you, right? Yeah, they might they might recognize me from the uh, the BetaWorks camp. Um, and again, above my pay grade to figure out between Fission, Fireproof, Composer, and whatnot, which would be best for our aims. And and then also, uh, when someone says local first database, databases mean many things. And I don't know mm -hmm. 
what aspects of what properties of what things that you're looking for and that we're looking for in the NeoBooks project in a database. Because right now we're just using a distributed store as GitHub. It's not really a database. You have to do your own data lookups on top of it if you want to do anything, which is, I think, what you're trying to solve for. Uh, trying to solve for, for, in my opinion, there's three things that we want to solve. Uh, one, we need to be able to, to build this data in a composable way. So we want pieces that know what they are, that know what they can connect to, that understand by the, the very nature of what they were created to be, that they have um, self-knowledge. So th that's more of a, a protocol than it is a, a you know a data store, but you need a data store that allows for that level of structure, right? You don't want just uh, text. So JSON, simple, uh, JSON structure that has key values, that have that know what those key values represent and um and and a structure that that we would need so we would need some kind of structure um second we would need that data to be able to be um linked to other pieces so this links to this links to this links to that um, and so databases are good at that because you can reference what does this link to and then Third, you want to be able to have that available to anybody to be able to um, connect to it, read it, edit it, comment on it, whatever it is that we choose to do, but you would want to do that. So I don't want this to be a technical call because I know most of us are not technical here, um, and, and including myself. I'm not super technical, but just enough to get myself in trouble. Um, and um, But... But I can't see how we get to the vision without going to this level of of sort of at least not necessarily creation, but at the very least specking of what it is we're looking for. And I I don't think it's just writing it in open text. Um There's also a variety of W3C linked open data protocols and other kinds of things. Yeah, exist. most of the stuff that I've pointed to it uses open um, open data links. Linking. LOD, linked open data yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, I know very little about linked open data. Go ahead, Rick. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think this technical technological conversation is incredibly important, but um, you know, I'm just interested in what's above the hood, so to speak, and how we can best use it. And I just came from a call we talked about, you know, how can humanity govern uh, AI and technology? Um, but I want to. A, a thought came to me just as I was coming online. What what if neobook was a verb and not a noun? And let me let me explain what I mean by that, because it was triggered when I um, Gil friend uh, put up a LinkedIn post about his new bot where you can ask Gil any question. So I did. I put it in and I put the question in the game and it was odd because it came up with a different response. The question was very much the same, but just a little tweet, not, nothing major. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people doing this now in terms of leaving a legacy of their life's work. But I, I want to um, perhaps, you know, have a note of caution about it because, you know, we all know, you know, Buckminster Fuller or anybody, any other big guru that we can think of. And, you know, what happens after they're, you know, after they've passed is that, you know, people carry on the tradition. Um, and I just came from a meeting, and I'd, I'd never been to one before. It's called the Institute of General Semantics. And I, I, I went to it. I didn't know much about it. I just showed it because I found it. Um, and when I, when I got into it, the guy uh, who was leading it, the executive director, had something behind his screen saying, the map is not the territory. And so, you know, I, I made a reference to... Um, uh, the original of the thing, uh, what's his name? Um, Karol Zinsky, who wrote a book called Sanity and Science back in 1931. And he was sort of like the, you know, the, the person who coined the phrase. 
And it was just fascinating to go into this academic where they're schooled in a way of thinking about semantics. Um, and uh, the reason why I bring it up is because I, I just felt like, you know, they said the map is not the territory, but I felt like they had turned him into the territory, which is a paradox. <laughs> you know, they got so schooled into it that they were surround. They got so sort of the, the metaphor is so pervasive and powerful that you know people become more attached to the territory than the map. And the whole point is to you know, um, and so why why I bring this up is that if one were to think about neo books as a verb, uh, and rather than writing a book, and this is where you know where my interest lies, is well, how do you create the scaffolding for inquiry that can be generative, where people can you know can co contribute do things by themselves, you have a repository of it. And it's, it's an, it's a, it, and when you have a neo book as a verb, it doesn't have a beginning and an end. So I just wanted to put out the idea of that. And to, for what I'm curious is what sort of technology would allow it to be able to develop um, um, branching networks of ecosystems where people can naturally affiliate around the particular areas that they're interested in, in terms of wicked problems, whether it's climate change or any, any of the other wicked problems. But we have to sort of zoom out and, you know, I, I've spoken about this before about, well, what is the meta governance for this? What's what I'm, I'm interested in equity meta governance. So I'll, I'll share a, a blog post that I just updated today, actually, that touches on this. And this is like, um, it's 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 sort of like the introduction to a chapter for the contributors to to share what it is they're taking away from the experience. So, what do you think about the idea of neo books as a noun and a verb? So, are we ne neo booking, or are, are we just booked into a neo book? <laughs> um. Many interesting ideas here. Uh, the the verb or nounness of it is intriguing to me because I, I tend to think that this is an activity that happens to leave behind artifacts. So I and, and you've made the point in different ways before, Rick, um, about uh, you're not interested so much in the artifacts, the books that a neo book project might do. You're really interested in the community or the insights or the learning process. I think um, both, you said both before and, both and. Yeah, both yeah. end. Both end. But yeah. but the art the artifacts are kind of way stations or boundary objects or yeah. uh stigmergic smears on the wall uh of, of the thing we're trying to do, which is like get you know, build some knowledge together and make decisions together. So I'm 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 in agreement with that. Um I will confess that I'm out of my league in the sense of how to frame this as a structural project. From the technical side, but also even from the uh, from the process side, in the sense of the best example I have of something that gives us most of the benefits, Jose, that you were talking about, is the World Wide Web, which uses HTML and URLs and a couple other things. And other people then suck up the pages and build indices, which we use, like Google, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's not as decentralized as IPFS, but I looked in, I looked under the hood at IPFS and. IPFS is not very permanent. IPFS is not a permanent store unless you start pinning your files. And pinning costs money. And I, more or less. Um, but I, I, pinning kind of turned me off IPFS a bunch uh, because I realized I didn't understand how to make a distributed store a permanent store in some way. But now, if you constantly host all of your own IPFS articles, as long as your host is up, I think you then don't need to pin. I don't know exactly how it all works. No, you pin, but you pin to your local. Your I I, I host a node and I pin okay. to my local. And the that file that I just money because it's yours. Right. So the file I just shared up there. Yep. Uh, the image. Were you able to? Is everybody able to open it? Uh, which one? The one it starts with the uh, B A B uh, B A F of Y. I get the site can't be reached. It breaks. Yeah. Okay. Because my node, you don't have access to my node, yep. but uh, that file is on my node. I haven't connected it to a whole bunch of different um, gateways, so you're not able to see it. But um, 
that file for people who know my gateway are able to see it. Is um, that file meant to be as public as a web page or is it meant to be a private file so we just don't have access? It's meant to be a, uh, it's it's behind a gateway and only people with with knowledge of that gateway can get access to it. So it's- Do we have to do like a pledge and a pinky square? <laughs> you, you would have to download a little thing on your browser. Okay. Um, but um, but the point is that if you host if you host your own node, um, then you don't have to pay anybody anything. Now there is uh, Web three host, uh, which is um, a service that the first I think fifteen gigs or something are free, um, and then you pay nominal amount after that for per gig, less than you would to an AWS or to a Google or or something like that. Um, so it isn't. It, it's not. It's it's like you would. If you wanted to host all of your drawings or your pictures on Google, it would be the same. Uh, except for it would then also be accessible to be pinned by others if you chose it to be. Uh, if it's not uh, secured by uh, by actually locking up the stuff behind um, crypto, right? Um, mm -hmm. So... Thanks. I was going to, be, just before Klaus raised his hand, I was going to ask if you or anyone else on the call has an, a different reply to Rick's question about what if you know, booking is a verb rather than a noun. Uh, so I'd love to just go there real quick and then come back to you, Klaus. So I, any... I personally do, um, but I've, go for it. I've already been talking. But... Uh, if you want to address that, I think that it'd be good to sort of... Yeah, back to my sense is that, that what I was describing was, I think, that. What I was describing was how do mm -hmm. we get into a place where it's an activity where mm -hmm. people can find stuff and use it and contribute to it. And the resulting stuff is also available and people could go see it and people could go read it and people, and, and, and it could be repurposed in other mm -hmm. social media right. and stuff of that nature by, by <clears throat> encapsulating it into something and then, uh, you know, putting it there. Uh, th I think that's the beauty of of having it be uh, decomposable and recomposable in different mm -hmm. areas. Right. Um, and that there is a place, a destination that people could use whatever front end they want to go to that destination and to uh, and to play with it, play with it. And some people might go, oh, I really want to write something special or I want to argue this point or whatever it might be. Exactly. And uh, and that in itself becomes the 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 energy mm -hmm. through which the other stuff is possible. And and to me, then if somebody makes a book out of it, if somebody makes let's let's forget book, if somebody makes a something tangible out of it and it doesn't have to be physically tangible but even digitally tangible then i think it shows others what is possible with the ability to do this so for me it is both and as as rick said mm. and it's a it's an activity that that people that we would need to to build a front end for that people would go, I'm going to go and spend an hour doing this. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, because this is cool. Because this is making a difference. Because this is fun. Whatever it is. It, it, it's not just a tool for an author that wants to go do it in the dark room mm -hmm. and, and never to be uh, seen by anyone else kind of thing. The activity so, itself. So the thing I'm missing that I wish I had, that I don't know that you want to put the time into, Jose, is an explanatory video that said, here's how using uh, fireproof or whatever other infrastructure would enable that. Here are the new features that would be arrived by using these sorts of tools. And here's how that would lead to composability, recomposability, because I have a narrative for findability and composability and all that, that just works with markdown files on GitHub. And I'm, I'm happily squirreling away on that 
Um, and don't I think I don't know why or I don't know what benefits the other infrastructure would 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 bring because GitHub is visible. GitHub is perfectly visible to the public. Uh, anybody can go browse it. It's got search uh, like like you post things on GitHub. Good things happen. It has version control. It has a bunch of stuff. It's not distributed. Um, but it's but a reason we made that choice. And then and then if what we want is distributed infrastructure, but not to worry about it, then we could go use Rich's platform and he'd be happy to have us beta test it. And that and then you can actually author frames, which are modules of code that run on top of his platform that we might do the composable things that you're thinking about. I don't know, but he's built a, a very deep and powerful thing, which he spent a bunch of a, a bunch of time and resources on over time. But what I don't know is what are the ben benefits and losses of each each approach and how does that happen? Um, did I mention listening to an Ethan Mollick uh, webinar in this call last week? I don't think I did. Mm, I don't remember. I'll come. I'll come back to that in a second. So um, I'll I'll just remember that. But um, if anybody else has a thought on the verb uh, neo booking as verb thing, let's go there for a second. Still. What's I mean? I can. Oh, and Klaus, you got your hand up. Pardon? Uh, yeah, Klaus has got his hand up, but I, but I think it's about a different topic. Ah. I just wanted to see if anybody, if I wanted to talk through the the verb question for a, a second before going to Klaus. Well, I'll just, I'll just flag, I'm starting reading Carol Sanford's, uh, I think it's her newest book, uh, No More Gold Stars. Hmm. And, and it, I think it's, I think it's kind of in this conversation, she's basically arguing with our theories of knowledge. Um, and so I'm trying to, I'm trying to tra track it and understand it, but, but, uh, it has to do with the 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 autonomy implicit in creating knowledge, I guess. And uh, that way. so I'm not sure I'm not sure quite what it does with the the verb of neo book, but but I think it, it, there is a comment in it. Thanks. I think there's a lot there about the dynamics of the school system and agency and a bunch of other things that I would agree with as well. So, but I've I've not read her book. Thanks, Dave. Right, go ahead, Klaus. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Um, maybe if I share the uh, architecture that uh, we're developing uh, uh, around this new book, but also around AI, um, some of the conversation may, may come together here. So, so we do have... Um, we do have the central uh, GPT. I mean, the the the, uh, uh, the central AI capacity, uh, and out of that, we are now developing GPTs, and these GPTs are specialized to specific functions. So, for example, one GPT in development is for TSPs, technical service providers for agriculture. Um, these are in betweens from USDA. Um, they're working on behalf of the soil and water conservation districts and other USDA agencies uh, to, to assist farmers to access uh, uh, federal funding and state funding. Another one is related to nutrition, um, uh, providing uh, a guide to cancer patients you know, to, to use uh, nutrition uh, to, to uh, regain their health. Um, so that is uh, that is one other version. I just got asked by the Sierra Club to develop a GPT that helps them to assess legislation, both at state and federal level, um, to extract uh, key points of uh, lobbying uh, for specific uh, 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 issues that uh, are related to you know water uh, pollution, environment, and things like that. So you see. Um, you see a, a, a level of uh, GPTs that are going, that are taking a deep dive into a very narrowly defined topic. And all of that uh, goes back into the Neo book in form of nuggets, right? Because I will, I will develop an article that sets the stage for this particular line of thinking um, and, and circulate this, get general agreement. And then so that's the knowledge base that we're drawing from. 
um, and that is the instruction that the GPT has. So if you develop a picture similar to the uh, picture that Jose just posted, the, the, the diagram, you, know, you have a, a, a core structure and then you have specialties pinging out, but uh, um, the the uh, and the reason why I posted what Gil has done at the front end, um, the uh, uh, the Delphi software that uh, that is now using sort of an avatar to to, uh, um, to where you basically clone yourself in in AI, that would actually work to develop a specialized GPT focused on nutrition, focused on TSP support and so on. Um, then the, the challenge is, and that's uh, in discussions with Pete, um, the, the, this will always require what, what Pete calls a concierge because the AI is simply not advanced sufficiently to hand it over to someone uh, and to ask questions and then run with it. There's too much garbage coming out if you don't know how to structure the question. It's not just structuring the question, but you have to uh, preface your question with data input. Uh, so the AI knows where you are, uh, which direction you are taking. Uh, it may miss information that uh, it will request more information and so on and so on. So, so that is... That is sort of where this is heading. Now, the Neo book in this in this case anchors uh, uh, the 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 information. So I've actually sent out volume one uh, to people who who are engaging, and now I'm getting inquiries on the net. You know, so I'm I'm. Uh, it looks like we're going to get hired by a CPG manufacturer uh, who just got a six million dollar grant from the government to establish farm to fork markets. Um, and so, so uh, uh, I sent out. Yes, here, here is what uh, this neo book, or, or what this AI you know, has produced, summarized in this neo book, um, and uh, so you can see the depth and and breadth of uh, thinking that has gone into into this development. So that's sort of where where we are designing the architecture to go to. Um, if we uh, expand, and it looks like we, we're getting really close to uh, getting some funding here, um, one thing that would be necessary to do is to set up classes to teach people how to use this stuff. You can't just hand over a GPT you know, to someone and so go on with it, but you actually have to then really set up classes. And the reason why we want to keep it centralized is because if we have like one GPT that is for nutrition, uh, uh, that requires constant updates. Yeah? Because as there is new data coming coming out, you need to you need to you need to feed that in, and you, so you need to advance the the GPTs and the knowledge base continuously. Um, so you may have you know hundreds of users on one GPT. But that GPT is then uh, anchored in uh, solid science, best available information, uh, which is why you have to keep it uh, centralized, which is also raising all kinds of other questions. <laughs> but uh, um, I mean, obviously, we would we would have to be you know responsible for uh, providing uh, the solid data here. Um, so, Klaus, are you are you using the Delphi platform like Gil is? Is that where you're? Doing this, or are you doing a different way? Or uh, I'm, I'm. We're going to recruit Pete for this uh, as soon as we are funding. Um, uh, we'll, we'll ask Pete to help us with that. I just came across. Uh, I saw what Gil was doing and backtracked it into the Delphi software, um, which is pretty. I mean, I, I think it's fantastic. You know, this is because you can uh, you, instead of uh, uh, highlighting a person and a resume. You highlight a GPT that's specialized to do this, yeah, um, and so so it's a it's a perfect interface, you know, if it can be if it can be appropriated. It looks really interesting. It's uh, <clears throat> um, hadn't seen it yet, so thank you. And then anybody else also for the new book project that would be, you know, maybe an entry platform you know, to. Uh, 
I mean, to have a, a sheet like this where you have the different topics and uh, you know you click on it and you go into a room where this new book is housed. And, yeah, um, it's interesting because originally in the neo book idea was that a book a book is just a playlist of nuggets which roll right. up into chapters which roll up into a book and you put some front matter and end matter on it and it smells like a book um you could also say that a collection of nuggets is a corpus and that you feed that corpus to a gpt of some sort and it can then use that particular corpus to answer questions like you were doing and like gil is doing um there's no reason that isn't the parallel thought to 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 the book thought, and I think that that's Klaus. That, that sounds like where you're headed. Um, well, the 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 neo book project is uh, is very broad, right? Because we it's a theory driven idea of developing of prototyping systems change, right? So the system co uh, uh, comprises a large number of subcomponents. Uh, and so, um, but, and, and in fact, in the, my meeting this morning with the Sierra Club, you know, they're in every conversation, they're instantly going into application discussions instead of working on a meta level discussion first, you know, to see where do you want to go. And then here is a subject that is a component of this destination, but it's not the destination in itself, right? So the neo book is a you need you need to have a description of the destination, you know where is this thing ultimately going to go, but then in order to get there you have to do a thousand things right because it's a complex adaptive system, and and so and it means something different for each area. So the challenge right now is uh, to talk with people who have never thought about meta level anything. Um, they are totally engaged in their local watershed, or you know, in 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 a micro, in a microscopic component of you know, we are anti K four, anti grazing, all this anti that, but they haven't really rolled that back into a into a into a systems perspective. So is to to teach, uh, and 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 that's what I see. I mean, in in the neo book at least that you know, that I've composed here. The idea really is step way, way, way back, and let's think about food for what it really is, mm -hmm. right? which is why we started ten thousand years ago, you know, to really uh, 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 get a deep uh, seated understanding about not just the physical implications, but the cultural, symbolic, you know, emotional components that are attached to this. So, so, uh, so that's the challenge, right? Is to, on the one hand. Uh, uh, foster a meta level thinking with a destination in the future of having a sustainable food system and a living planet, uh, and then break that down into where does this fit you? You know, how do you how do you see yourself fit into this picture, and where are you going to deploy yourself? Plus, how do you see what you're creating fitting alongside, next to, within some network of? other people also having opinions about this and, and um, offering resources on it, on these topics, uh, specifically on the food system topics? Well, my, my, uh, my take on it now is to uh, become a resource, uh, a research resource. Right? So um, rather than arguing or, or you know, trying to convince people about, just ask me your question, see what you want to do, and then structure the response in such a way that it sucks them into the, the, the deeper picture, the connections and the relationships there that they are touching, right? So, so it's sort of a serendipity created, right? Um, and uh, so, so uh, yeah, so I see that. Now, the one thing where I'm going to act differently is with the CPG manufacturer, because I will probably develop a, a target group marketing organization, because that's my skill set, you know, so let's, uh, Let's develop here a, a marketing capacity that addresses, you know, different segments and specializes you know, around, you know, maybe three or four of them, that sort of thing. But other than that, when it comes to, you know, to the science and 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 the the uh, legislation or whatever you take, 
right? All I can do is provide you with support. And this AI is stunning, right? I mean, I had, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, for example, just an example, the uh, Bionutrient Food Association is working on uh, developing uh, a, a nutrient density measure tool, right? Yes. And, and so I, I developed the, uh, no, I developed a question with the AI that uh, and sent to them as an example of how you could think about this. And it just floored them because they're saying this thing basically summarized two years of our research. Right? And, and yes. I've done it in like <laughs> a couple hours. Go ahead, sorry, are you done? Yeah. Um, this would be a good moment for me to report in on Ethan Mollick's uh, webinar because um, was it just last week? Let me just look at my calendar real quick. Uh, here we are. Yes, Ethan Mollick last Wednesday. That's why I didn't report on it here uh, last Monday. So Ethan Mollick is a professor at Wharton, uh, professor of innovation and entrepreneurship. He's been around for a while, but he's, he's relatively young, very friendly, fast talking, but smart and uh, really goes about explaining things very crisply. Uh, and he did a one hour session for the Wharton Club of Portland, which I have done nothing with. I've never attended anything from them, but I got a flyer that said, hey, Ethan Mollick is gonna do a, a, a seminar for us. And it was on a regular Zoom call. So we were able to chat and ask questions and do whatever else. And there were only like 35 people max on the call. So it was a small group relative to who Ethan would normally attract, I think, which was very nice. Um, and he kind of exploded my head, uh, which is kind of the, the, the reason I want to put the conversation in here. And what, toward the end of the conversation, he was talking about, you know, he used to give his students, because he's busy teaching MBAs at Wharton. So he used to give his students the assignment to build some thing for a major multinational company. Now he assigns them to put a major multinational out of business. Um, another assignment he has is for, for his kids to do something impossible. And, and the example I remember from what he means is you have a, a, you have a work team, right? A work group uh, with a, a project team of students, none of whom in that particular team know how to code a, a CNC machine or a CAD CAM machine and run a 3D printer. They don't know how, but they have a product idea and they'd like to have a prototype. So they asked GPT or some other engine and, and sort of picking which engine is a piece of the art, I think here, but they ask it to do all the code and to write that code and submit it. And you can now uh, send things off to get printed by someone else on their printer and they'll mail you a box full of your prototypes. So one of the photographs he showed, and, and it was very funny, uh, at the top of his presentation, he had a deck. He said, only one of these photographs is real. All the other photographs were generated and, and it was hard to figure out which was the real photograph uh, in, in his deck. But um, but what he meant by impossible was he had a team go and make a product and have a, have a prototype, which would have been impossible for them uh, without these tools and without this capacity. Uh, he also, uh, one of the questions he'll ask people is, have you put in you know, 10 hours using GPT? Because there's a threshold he finds. There's a threshold, and I think Klaus, you're way past this and probably several other people on this call are as well. But there's a threshold at which you begin to understand how to talk to this thing like it's a colleague and you begin to understand its limitations, what will juice it up, what will, you know, so, so when he was writing prompts, uh, you know, the second half of his presentation was him generating prompts and starting to do things with it that were astonishing. So he said, look, uh, you know, we can get a business plan created for a, a company and a product within like an hour with prompt, with, the, with prompts and all that kind of things, which would have been a person's term project. It, and there's this compression of time and effort that he seems to be ahead of because he's just like loves this compression where I think a bunch of other people, probably including a piece of my head are like, holy crap, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You do what and how fast? And it, it was lovely. It was really super interesting. He was very clear and enthusiastic, but he just kept like whipping out the, uh, the, the, the examples. The call uh, was not recorded because Portland Club of Portland doesn't record the call. So I can't point you to the, the call itself, the recording. Uh, but I, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, Ethan is quite visible online. He's got a bunch of stuff on YouTube and other places. So you can go. I recommend not only to go watch a thing or two that he's done, but if you have a skeptic, because I, 
in the same week's email, there was an article by a woman, Molly White, who was a, a Bitcoin skeptic and has turned into an AI skeptic. And what her article is like, yeah, I don't, I don't see what the, what the fuss is basically. And I read her piece and I'm like, hmm, I have a funny feeling she hasn't had the, the good 10 hour experience to try to figure out how to jump in as deeply as Malik has. And Malik is not a cheerleader saying, hey, this is going to solve everything. He's not that. And I've seen those people as well out in the arena. I've seen people who are like, oh my God, this is magic. It's going to fix, it's going to fix and transform everything. He is very practically saying, hey, look, here's what I can make it do. And here's how much better and faster it is than the thing I used to do. It's it's really pragmatic. But he's he's asking it to do really big things. And it doesn't care. It doesn't break into a sweat. It takes about the same time to do a business plan for a whole new startup as it does to answer like what the tomorrow's weather is going to be. It, 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 it's like this tireless worker that's actually pretty damn smart, especially once you start to figure out how to talk to it. Anyway, I, I think I said a couple of things that a lot of you already know, um, but I was inspired to try to figure out how to leap myself forward in my use of these tools because I'm using them a bit, but nowhere near as interestingly and ambitiously as he is. And I think if I did, a lot of other things might get transformed, including, Jose, the question I asked you a moment ago, which was, gosh, I wish there was some explanation of what the difference is between using you know, distributed platforms like IPFS and this and this and this. You know, I, I should go compose a couple of prompts and have, have GPT explain it to me like I'm 10 or 18 um, and see how that plays. Because I have a funny feeling that uh, my understanding of a, a bunch of the obstacles here and our ability to meet each other in a place where you feel there's enough structure and I feel there's enough looseness to play uh, and simplicity of use, which is important as well, um, can meet. And uh, so I'm, that, that's kind of where it put me. It, it, it put me on this like uh, riled up, but not yet competent with that level of capacity uh, kind of place. I think so, that the technology that I was pointing at would actually be the only way to make it easy to use. Um, because I think that the, the smarts can actually be built into it. And so that the user doesn't have to figure out how everything links, how everything's sorted, how everything's like, they're just looking at the, like social media, when you think about it, is super complex. But the users of social media have a really simple interface. Because the addiction developers have created really, really simple things that you just do over and over within the different platforms. And, and pretty much any that's... platform has, you yeah. know, a handful of things that most people do. Right. And, and, and it allows for just about everything to manifest. Now, the creators who, who create for that do a lot of work, right? But the consumers have a, a really easy way to do it. So I think it's a little bit of both. It's like we we want to make it easier for the creators and the consumers. And, you know, obviously not social media crazy shit, but, but there is, I think there's a lesson to be learned there, which is make it simple. And the simplicity isn't actually in the user having complete and utter freedom because that becomes the complexity right there needs to be some structure that that holds things together and, and are is easy to understand that's my my sense of it interesting go ahead Miles. yeah i think we're quite a ways away from this kind of simplicity at least in the professional setting um the so so the the answers that i you know, get out with my 40 years of corporate experience and, and uh, you know, senior level management background on very technical issues will always be different you know, than some uh, some beginner who uh, 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 has uh, discovered the world of business. I mean, there, there is a difference in, in you, you, you have to, you, you have to know um, the topic you're talking about in its complexity 
right? The, the AI actually levels itself to the cognitive level of your question, right? I mean, it plays back at the same cognition that you approach it with. Um, and so, so the, the, this is why you will, we, we will need a, this kind of concierge uh, to, to the AI for quite a while because the, you know, the next iteration of AI where you know, it becomes an independent thinker, that's quite a bit of, that's quite a bit uh, in the future. Now, maybe not as far as we, as we think because everything is running like crazy, but it's not here yet, you know, and it's not quite foreseeable. So, so the, the, um, so I, I, I see, you know, build the most intelligent uh, GPT you can think of and feed it with you now all kinds of data, but then you still need this linkage, this interpretation uh, of what exactly are you trying to to get answered, and you know, you know what what is what what have you not asked me that you should ask me if this is the response you're trying to find. So you need this interface, right? And you need to train people to be in that interface. And this is why the fastest growing job right now is the uh, 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 AI, uh, uh, what, did, what did they call it? Uh, 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 right? AI prompting is the fastest growing profession. I mean, anybody, it's just like when Excel spreadsheet came out, the first guys, you know, who, yeah, I can do this, they were way out there. You know? And so that's where, where it is going with AI right now. There's a really interesting dance I noticed a long time ago. I used to be an advisor to AT&T Labs back when AT&T was <clears throat> still AT&T before it became the rebadged Southwestern Bell. Um, and Dave Nagel ran AT&T Labs and he had a bunch of us in as his advisors. And I was trying to argue about voice over IP telephony. I was like, why are you guys not doing any VoIP? And, and there's this balance between knowing the depth that you just said, Klaus, and something that might be called beginner's mind out of Zen, uh, but th but there's there's a dance between the two because if you're ignorant about how things work at all, you're probably not going to invent the right thing or something interesting. If you know a lot about the subject at hand, and in this case it was telephony and how does how does the phone system work? Uh, what is the what are the plans of the phone system? The advanced intelligent network and ISDN and Sonnet and a bunch of those kinds of things you kind of had to know about. And along the way, you would learn about the North American numbering plan, how we get phone numbers and PBXs and switches. And all of that kind of stuff was interesting, but if you but if you assumed a lot of it to be true, um, you would get stuck and never invent the new thing. So one of the complaints that I got, one of the, the pushback I got from engineers, uh, was well, everybody knows that TCP/IP is terrible for voice communications, and yeah, compared to protocols that were developed specifically for voice communications and the work they were doing to slice and dice, uh, you know, optical fiber, yeah. But it turns out who won. TCP/IP one. The, the, we're talking right now over TCP/IP over these long distances because a whole bunch of other things got faster, better, bigger, so that this inefficient protocol could work over really big, juicy pipes. And look, we we think nothing of talking weekly in full in full glorious video with eh, lousy definition, little thumbnails, but it's pretty good, right? And the marginal cost of it is to us is zero, even though there's an energetic cost. Anyway, I say all this because. I'm, I'm with you, Klaus, and I'm trying to figure out how to model this in a system somehow so that more people can understand that the different nuances and interdependencies of a complex system, like food, food services, nutrition, uh, the earth, and all those things. And yet there can be some letting go of what you know so that the clear new thing can actually show up because beginner's mind says, yeah, we don't actually need 90% of that infrastructure. What, one of the big insights from telephony is that um, some 60% of the operating cost of a phone company was the billing engine. And the billing engine was this microtransaction engine that was recording how long you talked to whom, how far did it go? It calculated tariffs. It if it was long distance, it had to do all this stuff. It was busy charging you for every call. And to the phone companies, the future was, we're just gonna charge for fat bits. When somebody does a video call, that'll be obviously more expensive because there's more, we're shipping back and forth. It requires more bandwidth. And the internet said, screw all that. But the internet had no interest in charging for the, the in, individual little, little frames. Um, and so the billing engine, which was the key monster inside of a phone company was worthless uh, in this new world. 
and needed to either be redesigned or dropped or, or something else had to happen. And it was, in fact, at that point, it became an anti-competitive problem to have a billing engine because you had this enormous cost and you had to send people bills all the time, right? Um, and, and the internet's like, hey, you know, where's my 80 bucks for the month and we're done. And, and, and I don't particularly care who you called or where you were as long as you didn't eat too much of the maximums or something like that. Sorry for the long screed, but right. I, I think that we're, I think we're for, for subject by subject for each of the things that we're interested in creating neo books about, we're, we're in that little dynamic, that little polarity of how do we make a lot available so that the nuances are readily there, which is why I asked, how do you see Klaus, your materials interacting with other peoples and in what sort of environment? And then how do we find our way to simpler interpretations of what's going on so that we can offer people, hey, um, you might want to drop these four things that you're doing and just do this simple thing over here because it'll cut right through and give you regenerative farming, carbon credits, blah, 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 blah. Well, think about the time it took for all this good work to, to take place and get us to where we are today. And think about how little time we have moving forward. So if you if you go back then and let's say we had AI available, right, to really think this stuff through, a lot of these ideas could have coalesced much, much faster, you know, and, and uh, some of the experiments that you know, consumed billions of dollars and let, went nowhere uh, could have been avoided. Now, so this is really the opportunity right now to use AI as a modeling uh, tool, you know, that, uh, that gets you, that, that uh, adjusts this complex adaptive system in ways that you can cut through all these you know, circum uh, uh, events and I mean all these these complex complications of trying something that you already can see it doesn't work. Anybody else with thoughts on that whole nexus of stuff? I I like the idea of um, of using AI not to be the the neo book necessarily but to facilitate the the neo book itself both the creation the uh and the dissemination of it like like making making the book approachable in a different way i like what what uh klaus has done in the past where oh how who are you? How should, how do you want to read this? As an example, right? Um, if there is a, a fundamental way of writing something, and there are, you know, fifty ways to rewrite it. Never mind different languages, but but mindsets, worldviews, ages, uh, reading levels, you name it, right? Um, all of that, I think, is one way to, to change how you consume the exact same material. Um, the other thing is using AI to uh, build better connections between um, logical concepts, right? Um, to, to, to be more um, rigid or, 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 or vigorous about how you back up uh, what it is you're writing, um, so that there is uh, a way for that logical thread to be understood and and to be questioned and to be validated and to be presented, not just as here's my opinion, poof, read it, like it or not, but here's here's a place and here's how we got here. I'll say when, when, when you describe the system I think you want, and this is just me interpreting, um, I yeah. sometimes env envision that one might pick up an assertion. And as you sort of pick it up, it has little strings attached to it. And this assertion has this particular worldview at this level over here, logically. Um, and from that, you can infer a bunch of a, a bunch of other things that are sort of substrings from there. And it's connected to this topic. And here are some other things from the topic. And there might be a different assertion, a in fact, a contradicting assertion in the same realm of, of, of ideas that would draw from other 
um, points of view or whatever else. And if you could m make your way back through and visit the points of view or understand the background and context of each of the statements, that might help you understand how these two statements either are in conflict more or might be resolved or might never be resolved. But, but you'd, you'd, you'd know why and where they come from in some sense. I love that picture. That is exactly the way I see it. And more importantly, I think those threads are hard for us to see. They're easy Bingo. for AI to see. That's that's really good. And and hyperlinks are manually attached threads, although hyperlinks can easily be automated. And, and the hyperlinkiness, the, the, the webby, webbiness of the web is its magic superpower. But I think the hyperlinking, just just generic hyperlinking, in other words, isn't enough. Isn't enough. That that I go, here's what I wrote. I'm linking to that and I'm linking to that and I'm linking to that. Okay. What are those links signify? Right. Yeah, right. Right. And there's well, there's a semantic web and semantic linking, which has tried to climb this mountain for some time and not, not, not made successfully. enough progress. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so building building a protocol of what that would be that would say. If you want to do this kind of link, you use this kind of link. And it's, you know, A. And A means this. And we understand that A means this. The AI understands that A means this. And so when we say, hey, navigate this whole bunch of stuff and tell us where this person, based on their worldview of what we just understood from them, where would their worldview fall off from this set of links, right? Oh, there it is. It's 15 links down. This is right. where their worldview gets displaced. Let's have a conversation at that level because maybe there's something there that we can discuss that we can't discuss 15 layers up. And I think I, think I had trouble hearing you many conversations ago because a piece of me was interpreting what you were saying as you wanted a canonical version of what's out there. Um, with all of the deep structure underneath it so that you can point to it. But by saying, and here's an assertion by a random human, and here's the different ways in which that, that assertion is manifest in the world and what it builds on, and here's an equally valid but very different opinion about the same topic, and all of a sudden we have like little DNA strands out in, in the world of this particular topic and discussion, but you can follow the, the the connectedness through that makes that makes a lot of sense and feels very rich to me as well. I think it maps very nicely to what I'd I'd like to see happen as well. I think I think we both see that this is a non-trivial thing to solve for. Um, go ahead, Rick. Uh, maybe just to dovetail on a couple of things that Klaus and Jose and you, you just said. Actually, I, I came from a Zoom call. Uh, a couple of days ago, where they were talking about how it's going to fit higher education. And somebody said, you know, the standards of master's degrees and PhDs will be so much higher as a consequence of uh, human AI uh, synergies. And uh, the, the, the question that I just sort of was musing over myself was, hold on a second, somebody's trying to get in touch with me, I'll switch it off. Um, is uh, I'll put it in the chat because it's one of the things you have to, but you know, how might learners co create human AI synergies to cultivate complex adaptive learning processes to develop epistemic equity and justice? It could be anything, but you know, how, how do we, how, how do we blend both the need to have your individual work, but how does your individual work connect to other work? And typically with master's degrees, that doesn't happen. You just do your stuff. And it does a little bit, your advisors and whatever, but it's not it's not creating a sort of a uh, an ecological uh, network system. So I, I I really think we are on the cusp of something major and transformational. And what my upside of this is that we'll actually be able to take on the dark side so much more effectively, because if we can harness that power, we can develop the sort of moral mycelium network to uh you know take down the big guys take them down tie them down <laughs> so a, a, i think a, a bunch of what i'm trying to work on including one of the presentations i'm trying to get done before going and writing the neobooks one is about 
this this AI to human intelligence bridge and cooperation. Uh, and there is a point of view out of, out there that says, hey, we should just stop taking notes and we should stop doing sense making ourselves because everything will be swallowed by the new AIs and they will answer us at any moment with the full knowledge of whatever it is they know. And I'm like, yeah, that feels like a really <laughs> bad path to go down <laughs> uh, for a variety yeah, of cool. for a variety of kind of logical reasons. But but a making the case, not non trivial. It's hard. It's like no 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 because I've got a slide right now where it says, hey, thinking is hard. Why do you want me to engage in thinking and then go go try to use a tool to put information together in some logic? That's hard. If the AI can do it like for for no sweat, why not just do that? Um, and so I'm I'm very interested in that that uh, synergy, synchronicity, symbiosis. I think symbiosis might be the best term here of, of how we can actually be deeply symbiotic with these new intelligences. Well, what the thing, I, just quick reaction. One is thinking of complexity as an external phenomena. That's one thing, but the internal one is the ontological perspectives of thinking, feeling, being, becoming, etc., which is hard work and it takes time. And so I think AI has the potential of being able to help facilitate the uh, ontological development so that people do learn how to think deeply. One of the problems is people that haven't developed the critical skills, they don't discern very well because the system is perfectly designed to make sure they don't develop those skills. I mostly agree with you, but I will also say that from my observation, people who appear to not have mastered any of those skills have those skills if you ask them about quilting or baseball or, or car repair or something that they're deeply passionate about, whatever it is, they will know, you know, in, in my cousin Vinny, where, where uh, I'm forgetting the name of the actress, knows that the, the timing for the particular model, make model Buick, because the one that she was asked about doesn't exist. Like they didn't, they didn't ship that in 64 or whatever it is. Like people know, like, like a lot of people, it's not that, I don't think we've all wasted our brains entirely. I think we've misdirected a, a whole lot of attention and useful and useful neural uh, work. Yeah, I, I would separate the issue of knowledge from critical thinking. I mean, there's a continuum there. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking more of high level critical thinking. Um, I mean, I just for example, I was having dinner with somebody who's an, who is a, a leadership consultant, and he told me about something that I knew something about. And it's, a, it's about a sound of salt water, which is a complete and utter sham. But he went down the rabbit hole of this and spent $300 a month taking the salt water, which is supposed to have there. And, you know, how do people who are very, who are very bright, um, you know, we're all gullible to some extent. We can, we can be, you know, people can market things to us to make us believe anything that they want us to believe. Yeah. So how do we, how, how, how can we have a counterforce to the discernment where people either are nefarious or they're just, you know, ill-informed um, about, you know, the wares that they're, they're selling. So I, 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 I see it as a continuum. Agreed. You know, this Delphi system where um, it encourages you to develop an avatar, uh, I think has a really good chance to bring AI closer to people who don't necessarily think in systems complexity and, and all this. Uh, but simply by um, if the AI is set up correctly, I mean, so so one, one step in there is... Uh, uh, which you know the, the the way I framed it is uh, treat me as a conversation partner, and use the Socratic mm -hmm. method of inquiry to advance my exactly. our conversation. So when you put in put that into the uh, GPT, um, now you are you are opening up an interactivity right that mm -hmm. uh, that brings the conversation further. And um, if if uh, um, if that, if those avatars, may, maybe you know, someone could program an avatar and make it readily accessible and customizable for someone who doesn't know much how to do this, right? So you just exactly. you just put in a user interface and tell me about yourself, kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then now you are you are set and you have a, a, a conversation partner that is pre-programmed, you know, with certain with certain um, ideas of. The, or, or with certain ways to interact 
right? We're conversation partners. I'm going to challenge you with questions, you know, as you as you mm -hmm. are feeding me stuff. That could really work well. I mean, just to build on what you just said, Klaus, is that if you had an av integral avatar that would take you up the different levels, and there's different frameworks out there, like there's one by uh, Perry, uh, a Harvard psychologist from 30 years ago who talked about cognitive development schemes, which is dualistic, multiplicity, and uh, contextual relativism. And that's a very simple thing. But how could you actually engage people in such a way that, that you can actually enhance their cognitive levels? So instead of being trapped by dualistic thinking, can they think of multiplicity and multiple perspectives? The problem with multiple perspectives and anything goes is that they're not all created equally. And so you have to have some discernment with contextual relativism to be able to work out, okay, which of these things are actually better than the other? But I, I you know, I, I, I see that as something that uh, what you're just describing, uh, and the same thing with Kohlberg's moral development framework. Um, you know, there will be ways in which we'll be able to enhance people's ontological development, their thinking, their feeling, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. you put uh, I might, I might be. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you say again, sorry. No, you you put in like the Stoics because the, uh -huh. the Stoics exactly the Stoics or you know Aristotle or you want to and, do and uh, and they take a, a a management guru you know one of those guys yeah, exactly exactly I think it could be fun so, yeah. so I actually programmed my personal coach uh, with with that kind of stuff you know too and it comes up with uh, not pretty chilling things so Pete I had a conversation with Pete the other day and. He goes, yeah, you know, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but it's not you training uh, AI, even so you're so impressed with your AI. The reality is it's training you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's what dogs do too. You know, they train you. <laughs> it goes both ways. Indeed, indeed. But I, I, I'm just, you know, just, you know, you, class, you just came alive with that. I'd love to know more about your, um, your, how, how your personal coach is training you to train it. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit? Maybe just say, say some, something about your experiences that fall into ontological realm of things, because it's exactly what we're talking about. Anything that comes to mind? It's more, it's more, even more general, you know, you, you, uh, you are, as you're asking questions, the AI detects inconsistencies in uh, the way you're framing uh, the topic, right? So it points that out and then, oh, I haven't thought about this. So now you have just learned something and it's inadvertent almost. Uh, mm -hmm. So right. to do that, and I've been working on this book now for over a year, right? And and uh, that's had you know, pretty you know, deep you know, conversations with, uh, you know, leading to very narrowly defined topic. So, I mean, that's how I discovered the small water cycle, right? I mean, I had no idea what the hydrologic mm -hmm. cycle is. And all of a sudden you find out, you know, most climate models missed the small water cycle, right? And you go, whoa, this is like pretty serious stuff. So, you know, I shared this with this here across the board with all the NGOs. And now everybody knows about small water cycle and how Fantastic. soil, uh, you know, I mean, the, the interaction between depleted soil and water and all these good things. So so you learn, you know, uh, by simply by this uh, determined interaction. And I'll tell you, companies, it's like my son's company, they're using chat GPT of uh, enterprise, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they, they have this thing trained up um, to really focus on their company. They're basically monitoring they're basically putting a tracker on everything that moves and mm. then they develop algorithms to uh, uh, recognize patterns and then make recommendations and so on they're just expanding into india and then europe and so on and the 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 it's an arms race right because there's right. Nothing, right. it's just linear optimization i mean it's just a very basic stuff but it's a total arms race because your algorithms have to be ahead of your competitors you know, to to uh, that means you have to have an amazingly well trained uh, workforce. So now, I mean, they are so advanced that a, that a mechanic can go online and ask the AI a particular question about this monitor, you know, or or how to code this uh, algorithm and so on. So companies that are embracing AI 
uh, and integrating it into their software are just you know, exploding in 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 the way that uh, they advance their product. Mm. You know, I just you know the way the way you describe what your discovery was when it opened a door that you didn't even know was there. Uh, I mean, that's a, a great example of of uh, gaining insights into something that um, you know enabled you to see something that was there but you didn't know about. But just hearing that little, you know, I, I was just thinking, how can you create sort of micro stories uh, like that? where people have, you know, they have a breakthrough understanding, a new insight of how, I mean, I feel like I'm using AI and it ha it's ha little ones are happening all the time. It'll throw, it'll, it's like, it's like a, um, a, a, a distorted mirror that you, it, it throws things back and, and you look at it and it says, well, that's interesting. And then it, you know, you, you, you dig a little bit deeper. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that having a level of curiosity and fun and doing this stuff is, uh, is what brings it alive. Totally. But how can you capture your story? See, I was very <clears> taken <throat> by the story, and you became very animated when you started talking about the well. How, how you know? Because you know, enthusiasm spreads. I mean, you know, as a marketer, one of the most important things is you have somebody who's enthusiastic. It draws people in. So, what I'm hoping is that what Pete is doing uh, at the AI salon, you know, he teaches uh, graphic uh, design. AI, mm -hmm. AI supported graphic design. Uh, I guess he does it for free. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's and it's it's a wonderful thing. But you know, we 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 should actually set up. And I think this is the next iteration. You'll see that pop up in no time. We should set up schools, uh, training classes. You know, for people to get into this kind of specialized uh, training because. I mean, I go to the tech meeting here in Bend, um, and uh, you see all the individual contractors and small companies. They just don't have the capacity to really get what this is. You know, then you're dealing with companies like like uh, now Samsara and and, uh, and and Grammarly also, and they are like totally in it, and they have you know, a dozen people working on it. So so mm -hmm. if we don't provides this capacity to independent uh, uh, contractors and, and smaller businesses, then they're going to fall further behind. You know, it's just, uh, uh, it's actually quite dangerous that that you have a further concentration taking place. So so I think this would be, I mean, there's just so much opportunity, you know, <laughs> to, to what you could be doing uh, with this technology. Uh, and I'm sure much, much of it is in development, you know, but um just uh not as focused and not as fast as he would want to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Klaus, have you discovered edco the economic development in central oregon group yeah okay good that's where april spoke recently and they, they have regular meetings so yeah 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 but you know uh they, they the, the problem is that um People just they 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 are just not there yet. You have to have you have to have people asking questions. You can't mm -hmm. exactly. You, know, so you, mm -hmm. you, 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 you have to get them interested enough. So like I'm I'm I met uh, last week at the climate tech meeting, a guy who owns a, a solar installation company, and I talked briefly with him. Are you familiar with agrivoltaics? You know, putting putting solar panels on farms. Um, in 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 a in a co relationship to where you grow vegetables underneath and you graze animals underneath, and he was yeah it's really complicated and stuff as well. Are you familiar what's happening throughout the country on this? And and I and I said let me I said I tell I tell you what I'm going to spend two hours of my time to give you a run through of what you could already pick up from uh, what's already out there in terms of science and. You know, uh, documentations and what have you, because I think it's just an amazing business opportunity. So I sent that to him. Now he wants to meet with me uh, and discuss that further, right? Because I think um, solar, I mean, we, we, solar could replace biofuels, right? You could, you could, it would take a fraction of the land mass uh, to to generate the same amount of energy uh, via solar as we do. Uh, using corn and soy, you know, for biofuels, and, and so so to to use this as a business opportunity and just go for it, right? 
So, so that's what I'm saying. I mean, they, they are just, uh, uh, but how does a small businessman get exposed to this kind of thinking and this kind of research? You know, that's, I think it's the challenge. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't help but uh, reflect about how could you create an avatar that would teach people how to become more curious and asking questions? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. it, it's nothing to it. It would, I mean, literally, um, Jose. I mean, it's a, it's literally, it's a no brainer. I mean, you could literally do this in an afternoon, you know, and, and, and then, uh, it's, it's like, it's marketing. It's just you know, put, putting it out there, making it available and, and, you know, at a really reasonable price, you could set up an internet business here you now with, with doing something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to have to boogie as well. Yeah, it, 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 it's very subversive, actually, in, in terms of training people to become curious and asking questions. Oh, thank so. you. <laughs> Can I just say one thing before we go to that Please. point? Because, like, Rick, when you were talking about, you know, the dark force, you know, combating the dark forces, the one thing that I'm really excited about with AI is when it comes to a question, as a human being, you can either take that question to be a rhetorical one or a Socratic one. That has to do with somebody's emotional makeup. So if you're at a place where you're expecting somebody to argue with you or to see what's wrong, that's not gonna foster the curiosity to ask questions. So I like the fact that we're using AI to do it because I don't think anybody's gonna talk to an AI and feel like the AI is trying to insult them. Mm -hmm. so I, would, what? I was saying somebody the other day that may, have, that may be offensive to some, I said, but I can actually refer to AI uh, to something that I wrote myself. But it, but coming for me it would be like, who are you? I oh, know it's from AI, right? It's just <laughs> like it's just like Moses coming down from the mountain saying, you know, I didn't do this. This was you know, God wrote this down here. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to take this serious. You know? well, so well, Tracy, Tracy, what you just triggered for me it, was when I was participating it, in this. Stacy, sorry, um, sorry. Um, w w w I was um, in in this group, and I wanted to ask a question, and I and I put it into the chat box. But I said, I don't want you to answer the question. I want you to answer what you think this question means. And so often, when you're, and you're talking about rhetorical versus you know Socratic, well, uh, there's more dimensions to that. And so um you know you just have one word in a question and people have different frames for it and they're going to be disagreeing with when they could be di agreeing and vice versa they may assume the same but it's different and so to, uh, the whole notion of of um you know um being more sophisticated in not only sense making but also in meaning making is, and purpose ethical purpose making all those three domains need to be orchestrated more effectively and how could ai help us with that Woo, that could be very subversive there's a paper I just realized I didn't have a mention to, and I'm looking it up um, uh, about how AI is, is becoming more per persuasive than humans. <clears throat> and so they're, they're, bench they're, they're benchmarking uh, people, convincing people to change their minds about something between a normal human conversation and an AI conversation. And it turns out AI in some cases is like 80% more effective. But yeah, I'm, not I'm, not sure surprised. What, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the conditions of the study are, but Stacey, that might be mm. interesting for you. Well, I'm wondering if anybody changed their minds. I would assume the norm is nobody changes their minds. <laughs> and so if one person did, the stats would have bumped way high. That's, that was, I, I haven't looked at the paper, but that, yeah, that's the one out of uh, the guys that came out, went out of open air. What's it? Uh, this is Salvi, Ribeiro, Galati, and West, apparently. It would be fun to watch people have their heads explode after talking to an AI. Then you know that this is somebody <laughs> that needs to be removed and retrained. Yeah. Okay, well, have a great week. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah. Good call. Bye. Really appreciate it. Thanks, okay. all. Have a good day. Bye now. You too. Bye.